Well, it is great to have you here as we continue our series we've entitled The Hard Sayings of Jesus, taking a look at some of the things Jesus said that sometimes uh, is tough to understand and, and other times really disturbs people, and I'm so glad you have joined us uh, online and in person as well. You know, if, if in any of these messages it, it hits a nerve and you want to go deeper into that subject, let us know. There are so many good authors out there that I've used through the years, and people like um, Greg Kuckel and, and Norm Geisler and Frank Turek and Tim Keller and uh, Jay Warner Wallace and a number of people all the time. And so if there's a way we can help you grow deeper and dig deeper into the scriptures, do let us know because we have a lot of resources that we can recommend for you. Many people have questions about God, religion, and the Bible. And that's, that's fine. Maybe that's, maybe that's you. I'm going to encourage you today to use your brain, to do some research. Don't just accept the opinions of your friends or those of your professors, especially when it comes to the Bible. Rather, you'll be missing out if you do. I'd rather have you do the hard work, do the mining yourself, and specifically work on the Bible itself today. You know, the, the biggest intellectual concerns people have with the Bible are most often held by people who are simply not very intellectually engaged. They know very little about it. And yet they'll tell you they've studied the Bible and they've found it wanting. But is it? One of the questions or the concerns you may hear from people who aren't really familiar with the Bible and don't really know too much about it but don't like it is they'll say something around this. Well, how can you actually believe the Bible when a bunch of guys just put it together and it's full of legends and stories and myths and errors? It's a good question. I'm not going to answer that question today. Jesus is going to answer that question by telling you what he believes about the Bible. And the first thing Jesus will tell you what he believes about the Bible is, is that he believes it's the very word of God. Take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law, God's word, until everything is accomplished. Jesus first mentions the inspiration of the Bible. Here he says, one day nature is going to disappear, but the scriptures, the Bible, is going to remain. See, if the Bible remains, if the scriptures remain, and heaven and earth and nature disappear, that tells us that the Bible is not natural. It's not a product of nature. It is supernatural. It is divine. Now, sometimes you'll people hear people say, well, you know, I think the Bible's one of the greatest books ever written. Maybe it's the greatest book ever written. But in the end, you know, it's written by just a bunch of guys got together, and it's really not that important and that special. Jesus believed the scriptures had a life that transcends heaven and earth. Jesus believed it was supernatural, divine. And he believed that about all of the scriptures. Theologians call that truth plenary verbal inspiration, which declares that every single word came from the mouth of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, all scripture is God-breathed. The Greek word's theopanoustos. Plenary inspiration is the belief that God gave the words, it's the very outbreath, the exhale of God. God didn't breathe into man's words. God didn't breathe into man's thoughts. God breathed out the very words he wanted them to write down, and he used their own individual vocabularies. But at this point, you might have someone look at you during this conversation and say this, but, but what about all of the errors in the Bible? Textual scholars have found many, many errors, right? in the Bible, and the, but they're very rare in the copies of the Bible. Um, they're about one in every thousand in the New Testament and one in every 1,580 in the Old Testament. They're very rare. And what you need to understand is that 99.9% .9 of them are copying mistakes. That computes mathematically to a, a text that is 99% pure. 
And even if you left in all of the spelling mistakes and copy mistakes and word inversions and the so-called difficult texts, not one of them, not one of them would change any major teaching or core doctrine in your Bible. And you need to understand that because you're probably being told something different on social media or in school. Jesus even goes further than that. He continues, he says this, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear until everything's accomplished. What Jesus is referring to there is the smallest letter in Hebrew. The smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet is a yod. It's about the size of a comma. And if it's missing from a Hebrew word, it can change the meaning of that word. Then Jesus says, not the least stroke of a pen. What he's referring to there is the strokes of a pen you make to go ahead and make the alphabet in English or in Greek or in Hebrew, those letters themselves. And uh, if, if you miss some of those, if you're a little off on some of those, it can actually change the word. Imagine, here's the English equivalent, for example. Let's say I'm drawing a G. You got that little hook at the bottom? I'm drawing a G. Well, let's say you accidentally draw a Q. The hook goes the other way. That can actually change a word in English, can it? Yes, it can, okay? Go like this. Yes, it can. All right? Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. The word rogue. Take a look. Rogue is a scoundrel spelled with a G. But if you spell it with a Q, it becomes an American variation of croquet. Right? A, a, a game we play in a hard service, though. That happens also in Greek and in Hebrew, and that's what Jesus is speaking about here. Many people today will say, I, I believe the basic truths of the Bible, but there are parts of it that I don't really believe anymore because, after all, it's the 21st century. Things change. Well, things have to change. But Jesus doesn't say just the main teachings of the Bible are God-breathed or just the major stories are God-breathed and the rest aren't. Jesus makes it very clear that not just the stories, not just the doctrines, not just the teachings, but not just the words, not just the letters, but the individual strokes of pens are all the divine, supernatural, perfect truth of God's word. And then he talks about it being authoritative. He says this, until everything is accomplished. Jesus doesn't just say that every bit of scripture is true. He says every bit needs to be accomplished. We need to read the Bible and honor the Bible and believe the Bible, but also understand God is accomplishing things through his word. But at this point, if you're in this discussion, here's a, an objection you might hear from someone, and it's this. But John, in this section right now, Jesus is talking about the Old Testament only because the New Testament hasn't been written yet, right? That's correct. Jesus will later in this ministry uh, promise the disciples that he'll send them the Holy Spirit as we heard in the readings so that they can have that same divine inspiration producing for us what we call the New Testament. But right here, Jesus is talking about the Old Testament and that only makes his statement stronger. Why? The vast majority of people who have a problem with your Bible today like to point to some episode or story in the Old Testament. In Jesus' ministry on this earth, he routinely quoted from every portion of the Old Testament and seemingly went out of his way to point out the veracity of those stories and events that others today think you're an idiot for actually believing. Let me just give you a few of them. You'll see them before you. Jesus believed in a real Adam and Eve, a real creation week, uh, the fact that marriage by design is a man and a woman. He believed in a worldwide flood. He believed in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He believed in a burning bush. He believed about manna from heaven and a, a brazen serpent. He had all of those things, all of those things he believed and more. Jesus believed that not just the major doctrines, not just the teachings, not just the thoughts, not just the flow, but everything in the scriptures, the words, the letters, the strokes of the letter, are God's word itself from the very mouth of God. Another challenge, though, you may hear at this point is people will say, okay, John, I'll give you that. The Bible was written by God. But we know from history that it was human beings who actually decided what books were in and what books were out. 
How do we know they got it right? Jesus here is talking about the Old Testament scriptures at a time when the Old Testament has already gone through the canonical process. Hundreds of years before Jesus was on this earth, the believers in the Old Testament had gotten together and decided which books are going to be in the Old Testament and which books were spurious, which were not God's word. That had already been decided, and Jesus certainly agreed with that because he calls them scriptures here. And so what we're sometimes missing that we don't see in this account is Jesus is telling us that not only does he believe that God can bring his perfect, supernatural, authoritative word and record it through human authors, but Jesus believes also that God can use those human authors to bring about the recognition of what books are God's word and what books are not. And he will do that again in what we call the New Testament. Jesus believed that every portion of Scripture, the Bible, was from the hand of God. Human beings wrote it down. They recorded it. Human beings collected it and gathered it and put it in a codex, the earliest form of a book. All underneath the guidance and power of God. Jesus believed every part was God's breath, God's word. Jesus believed that when God wrote, his pen did not slip and his ink did not fade. As one person said, God's pen is indelible. But Jesus didn't just believe that, he lived that. Just take a look at the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. We call it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, right? Look, when Jesus is tempted by the devil in, recorded in Matthew chapter 4, what does he do to thwart the devil's attack? Every time he says, it is written. During Jesus' ministry, when he's attacked by the religious leaders of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees, what does he say again and again to them? It is written. Bible. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane with Peter, and Peter draws his sword to defend Jesus, what does Jesus say to Peter? Does he say, Peter, don't, put that, don't take your sword out, it's going to go bad for you. No, Jesus says, put your sword away. How else can Scripture be fulfilled? On the cross, in the worst situation you could ever be, Jesus has the weight of the sins of the whole world, all of your sins and my sins, on his shoulders. He's suffering the agony of hell, separation from God, because of me and for me. So what does Jesus do on the cross? He screams out Psalm 22 and Psalm 31. That's just who he was. Everything he taught was through the power of Scripture. Everything he did was through the grid of Scripture. Jesus believed the Bible was the very words of God. That's what he believed about the Bible. So let me ask you, is that your view of the Bible? You really can't be a Jesus follower if you have a different view of the Bible than Jesus does. Now understand... I'm not saying that if, uh, if you struggle with some things taught in the Bible or you're working your way through a certain doctrine, that you're not necessarily a Jesus follower, a Christian, okay? Remember what saves. Saving trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross is what saves. Not your intellectual ability to always understand everything God wrote through the power of the Holy Spirit with your finite, flawed, three-pound brain. On the other hand, You cannot call yourself a Jesus follower, a Christian, and then blatantly deny and refuse to believe portions of Scripture just because they're not popular today, or they cramp your lifestyle, or they're not going to let you trend on social media. To do so is really inconsistent because you call yourself a Jesus follower, and yet you don't follow him, and you're also attacking the very dynamic that was his life and ministry, his word. You know, people say, well, I believe a lot of this, and there's a lot of good stuff in this book, and it's really neat to read once in a while, but there are some parts I I don't like, and that's because they're encroaching in some area of your life. In essence, what you're saying is, you know, I I like the Bible, but this doctrine and this area of my life and and this choice, I'm not going to give to Jesus. That usually happens in sexuality today. 
and in money or both. And let me just be very clear. If that's you, you don't want the Jesus of the Bible. You want the Jesus of your own making. And that Jesus will never save you. Tell me, do, do you sift through the Bible looking at what you agree with and what you don't agree with so you'll go ahead and jettison that? Or do you allow the Bible to sift you to show you what is right and good and what needs improvement and is wrong and should be thrown out of your life? Is the Bible the authority over every area of your life? Or are you really the authority over the Bible? Jesus doesn't want you only to know that he believes the Bible is the very words of God. He also wants you to know that the Bible is all about him, and it's not about you. He says that in verse 17. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is telling the Pharisees of his day and the Pharisees of our day that the Old Testament is all about him. The word fulfilled here or accomplished means to fill up a cup, to fill it up. Now, as New Testament Christians, we know that the Old Testament is like a big arrow pointing to the Savior to come. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled the Old Testament for us. And that's why certain parts of it no longer are applicable to New Testament Christians. Like the food laws and when you worship and how you worship and clothing laws and, and you know, the civil and ceremonial laws. Jesus has perfectly fulfilled all of those things. That's, that's important to know. When Jesus arrives on the scene, the moment he's here, you cannot, you cannot look at the Old Testament the same way. And also, you can't just jettison the Old Testament because now you've got the New Testament. The Old Testament's still important for you as a Christian, a Jesus follower. Let me, let me illustrate that with the illustration I learned from a couple other people. I'm going to use a water bottle today. I could use a cup or a glass, but I'm use a water bottle because so many of you bring them in, the service. And of course, you, you can see this is probably my water bottle with all the floral pattern on it. It fits me so nicely. Um, actually, I got it out of the lost and found. Um, so claim it after the service. Well, after the next service, okay? Um, picture this water bottle and the water in it. The water in it is Jesus and his message of salvation. He's the Savior, the Messiah. The water bottle is the Old Testament. If the water, you need the water bottle to bring water to you to quench your thirst, right? That's how that works. A water bottle that doesn't hold water is worthless. But you can't drink the water without the water bottle. What Jesus is telling us here is that as New Testament Christians, we need to understand the Old Testament if we're really going to understand what he's come to do for us and has done for us. We need to understand the prophets and the priests and the kings and the wars and the captivities and the conquests and, and the sacrificial system and the exodus if we're really going to understand everything that Jesus has done for us. It's all about him. That's what Jesus said to his disciples right after the resurrection onto the road to Emmaus when he said this. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Scripture is all about Jesus. And then Jesus says this, if you read the Bible the way he reads it, it will change your life. Verse 19, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is teaching you when you read the Bible like he reads it, you internalize the gospel, and Jesus becomes the foundation and the motivation in your life. Then your life far surpasses the religiosity of the Pharisees who always looked at Scripture as a way to help them earn salvation, to help them get good in God's sight. And once again, as we will in this series again and again, 
we come to the difference between religious people, who often sometimes sit in churches, and Jesus followers. See, religious people think the Bible's all about them. They think it's a how-to book. That's how they usually use it. They think, well, how can I be right with God? What do I need to do to earn more merit with God and earn favor with God? Or, um, it's a self-help book, right? Uh, how can I have a better this and better that? Or, they see it, the, the Bible as um, a way to get rich. That's the prosperity gospel today that's floating around. It's horrible. They think it's all about them. Christianity and Christians understand the Bible's all about Jesus. It's not a how-to book, it's a whodunit book. See, uh, religious people today, inside the church and outside the church, often um, they, they believe Christianity comes from the outside in. And oftentimes they believe that because they're void inside. They have no self-esteem. They're f- afraid of death. They're not really sure what the truth is, but they don't want anybody to cramp their lifestyle, so they're very insecure. And so they're looking for things on the outside to fill the void in the inside. Real Christianity is from the inside out. Jesus would tell you that the driving force in your life as a Jesus follower in the 21st century needs to be the message of his rescue and full forgiveness he's won for you on the cross that was prophesied in the Old Testament, fulfilled in his life, death, and resurrection. And that needs to be the motivating factor and the guide in your life. Jesus understood real Christianity is from the inside out. So if you have a friend who asks you, you know, why you believe the Bible is full of errors and, you know, something like that, simply look at your friend and say, well, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, here's what he believed about the Bible. He believed not just the words, not just the letters, but the very parts of the letters are from God's word and are God's word, the, the supernatural truth. He believed it was all about him, not about you. And he said, if you read it the way he reads it, it'll change your life now and forever. And that's what Jesus believed about the Bible. 